down to the respiratory system, it's going to be three parts. We're going to try to get through part one and two, which is the airway, just your basic anatomy of just how to get the air down to the alveolus. And then how do we breathe? What are the mechanics of actually getting air in and out? And kind of the basic structures and the volumes. We're going to end with that so that next, our next class session will be more about the physiology and the exchange and the oxygen. So the functions of the respiratory system are such that we want a huge surface area. And surface area is going to be the name of the game between the respiratory and the GI system that we're going to be going to in the next um, couple weeks. So surface area means the interface between our air and our blood. We want to maximize that exchange. So instead of having just a giant thoracic cavity where you're just like, put a bunch of air into this giant balloon and hope that blood around the outside exchanges enough with it, we made tiny, tiny, millions of tiny little rooms of air that each little room has its own blood supply. So we have a much greater surface area. In some pathology, when we go on Wednesday, our next class session will be, you'll see how emphysema, the primary problem with emphysema is it reduces the surface area. It makes giant holes, essentially, in our lungs and so big air pockets, but less exchange surface. So surface area is a really important component of our respiratory system. We also need just your basic piping, just the pathway to bring it in. Once we have air inside, we want to modify it. We want, say here in the desert, we want to humidify it that's coming in. We don't want to just dry everything out. So we want to add some water vapor to it. We also want to clean it. If you're sitting there at a bus stop and a bus takes off and this exhaust comes out, you can see with the exhaust, you're visually seeing carbon particles in the air. You go to breathe that in, your alveoli don't really want that. So we want to be able to filter it out. So the more surface that we can put this air through that's going to trap airborne debris. So in our nasal cavity, we have mucus. We have hair. It's not just for grandpas. We have hair in our nose. The mucus goes out. So it's like all these limbs that have mucus in them so that when air comes through it, we have more places to trap this airborne debris and these carbon particles. So that's why if you're out somewhere, you know, when I was in college, paying for college, I used to fight fires and this is too much information, sorry. But when you blow your nose, it's all black and nasty. And then you're like, hello, thank you, respiratory system and mucus for trapping it because it didn't make it. So that's the whole point. So if you're running down on a dusty road, you're going to blow your nose, it'll be disgusting because you're just, but it's getting more. So it's doing its job. That's the point of the trapping of nasty things that you're breathing in. So that's, and then we also humidify it and we filter it. So, and we want to warm it up. So I went to graduate school up in Canada. So you don't experience this so much down here, but when I was in Calgary, you're outside, that air is pretty darn cold. So we actually want to create an environment that we warm it up before it goes down into our lungs. Also, sound production. That's what we're doing here, respiratory system, is the air coming out for our sound and the location for olfaction or smell. So the conducting portion of the respiratory system is just the piping. That's all. It's just like the way to get air down into the lungs. And then the portion here that says the respiratory portion, that's more where we're actually exchanging with some oxygen. So the last, they call them respiratory bronchioles. They're also known as terminal bronchioles, meaning the last little tube that's arriving to the alveolar clusters, they'll have a couple of alveoli on them. So they're also exchanging oxygen. So you might want to visualize in their head this whole respiratory system as a bunch of grapes. And if you think of a grape bunch that you're getting from the produce section, and the stems, imagine the, the stems of the grapes being tiny little tubes. So like with air can go through. And then finally, the ends of the grapes, if you think the grape, just the skin, and then take out the fruit, you've got an alveolus. Now air can go in there, a really thin membrane, but each single one has its own little straw tube going to it through, you know, bigger stem, smaller and smaller. So that's really the bronchi the respiratory tree. So this is kind of, you can see this here as it extends out, bronchial, and we get to these last ones, terminal bronchioles, which also are respiratory bronchioles because they exchange air. The mucosa, what's lining our respiratory tract, is made of pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelial tissue with goblet cells. You can see the cilia here. This is kind of a 
aerial view, you can see it here in this cartoon and then the real picture. These white for cells are the goblet cells. We got goblets. They make mucus. So you put the mucus up here with the cilia. So it's this whole mucus gel. And then the cilia, they move in a beautiful fashion. If you've ever seen a documentary of like the Catalina Islands or underwater view of like seaweed and you see the seaweed moving with the currents, that's what our cilia is. It's a little not so, you know, mishmash as that. They really move in concert. So in your respiratory tract, you've got this mucus that's going to be in there, and then the cilia are constantly breaking up. So all the debris, airborne debris that it traps, is going to get trapped and then migrated up. And then you swallow it, sounds gross, but you do on a regular basis, or you, there's a lot of it, and you're going to kind of hook it up. So it's kind of can be as much as it's moving along or it's coming down. So if you smoke, however, you know the analogy with the bus stop and you're sitting there in the big gas exhaust and you've got all the air and you can actually see the carbon particles. So people that smoke, they're just like, you know what, I need a more efficient way to get that in my body. So they're just taking it directly to their mouth so that they can get as much carbon particles in and then all of a sudden their body needs to do a lot more trapping of these airborne carbon particles. So it's really up to the mucus to stick along the walls, along all the bronchioles and the trachea and so on, and then the cilia to move it up. Except in cigarette smoke, there are other ingredients in there that besides the carcinogens that we're bringing in with our carbon particles, that the other agents paralyze the cilia. So it really goes nowhere. So not only when people smoke, they're bringing in additional carbon particles, that's why you see the smoke, into your body, but then the carcinogens are on the pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue and it adheres here. Now you're only one cell layer thick, because remember pseudostratified means it's not really stacked, it's actually one cell side by side, so it's only one cell layer thick. It's pseudostratified because we have some short ones and some tall ones, so it looks like they're stacked up, but it's really only one cell layer thick. It's constantly growing, so you got some baby ones and some adult ones, and they're constantly growing up, and that's why it has this pseudostratified appearance. So not only is the, you're directly bringing in carcinogens, attaching it, but you're letting them hang out longer so they can be more effective at damaging your DNA while they're there by paralyzing cilia. What is the longest duration in a day that a smoker goes without smoking? When they're sleeping. So what do they sound like when they wake up in the morning? <laughs> yeah, there you go, that's exactly what they sound. And then my grandfather's like, oh, you know, a lot of hawking and coughing and, you know, and that's because that longer duration, the cilia woke up all of a sudden they were not paralyzed anymore and there was a lot of gunked up mucus. So the cilia are back in action trying to mobilize all of the stuff that had been stuck to the wall throughout the day, the day before and trying to remove it. So what's the first thing that a smoker's gonna do when they get up? Cough after they cough. They're gonna go get another cigarette so they can re-paralyze their cilia because we don't wanna get rid of the carcinogen. So we're just gonna stay there. So that's kind of the effect of smoking is it's not only your breathing but you're immobilizing your own body's ability to try to remove them from the body. So it's a bit of a tough way. So really, the better way, if you're going to smoke, would be through your nose. Because now you have even more surface to trap the debris through your nasal cavity. It may not be nearly as attractive, but it would be a little bit more effective at removing some of that airborne debris, and you can just blow it out, you know. So this is another example of looking at the pseudocertified columnar ciliated epithelial tissue. Layer thick, it's constantly growing. The cilia are really important with the mucus. Trap airborne debris and move it out. So after we've done the majority of our nasal cavity, it really is more effective to have air coming through your nasal cavity in terms of your ability to filter it than straight through your mouth. This picture is kind of creepy. I get that, but I like it because it those the nasal concha. So it's the nasal cavity that I think is really cool in this particular picture. And I happen to have a slice here to show you from one of our own collections. I did not plastinate these. I don't do the human ones. So you can see this slice. Let me show it here. This slice, you can see how thin the nasal concha, this guy's got a little more inflamed nasal concha. You guys recall from 201 that in the nasal cavity, most of our, or 
all of our real skulls in the other room. They've been long since broken, but I think this is where you one, so you'll, you should see some of the nasal conscious. So there's three of them, middle and inferior. And the purpose of the nasal concha is to create turbulence. You want the air to come in, but you want the air to swirl around. And if air is going to swirl around, and you're going to slow it down. If you're going to slow it down, you give it a chance to like stick to the mucus, you get a chance to clean it out a little bit more, you have a better chance to equilibrate it with the humidity in your body, so you're going to humidify it, add some water vapor to it, and you're going to equilibrate the temperature. In a really cold environment, it allows for that warming of the air before it continues on down. So those are some really important considerations that you need to know. Then we have the hard palate and the soft palate. So we can see the hard palate is made of bone, and we have it's the maxilla as well as the palatine bone. And the soft palate is behind it, and is this portion here in green. So the soft palate actually can hinge back. So if you look open, so look at someone's mouth, you've got that uvula, which is the punching bag in the back of the throat. When you're trying to swallow food, that soft palate, which is hanging down, allowing air to go through your nasal cavity and back. But when you want food to go through your mouth, that uvula swings back and sticks to the back wall of your throat to prevent food from coming up and out your nose. This is the cadaver view. I also have a real fascinated cadaver that has the same thing. So we've got going, so I'll show you this. So you can see on here, there are the three conscious. So you can see on this picture, the superior is quite high. Then we have the hat palette, the hard and soft. So you can see on this picture where the hard palette ends and where the soft palette is around here. here and the uvula hangs back, hangs down. So it's the, is the eustachian tube opening. So that's the air where you're equilibrating into the middle ear, where right behind the tympanic membrane. So you can balance that, um, the bending of the tympanic membrane based on outside pr air pressure. We also have the olfactory nerves at the top of this image here. So we have, if you recall from 201, the olfactory bulbs lay down in the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone, and there's those holes like a cribbage board, and nerves go down through those holes, and they have the nerve endings that hang into our nasal cavity, a lot like chandeliers. Like if you're gonna go to a lighting store and you've got all kinds of different lights in there, that's what it looks like in your upper nasal cavity. And so we actually need what we're smelling to dissolve into the mucus so we can bind to those nerve endings. So when you have a cold and you have excessive amount of mucus, now it takes so much farther for those molecules to dissolve through the mucus that it usually doesn't get to it. And that's why you can't really see when you have a stuffy nose. And the purpose of the nasal concha is to create turbulence. Why we want turbulence? We need to slow air down so that we can warm it, humidify it, and clean it. Okay. Those should be subset in for pharynx. They're regions of the pharynx. So this picture, you can see we went from the nasal cavity and the oral cavity. So that's the nose and mouth. The very back of both of those is the pharynx with a pH. There are three distinct regions of the pharynx. Nasal pharynx, the top, obviously behind the nasal cavity. Oral pharynx, obviously behind the oral cavity. And then the laryngopharynx, which is right above the larynx. This a particular image shows it in blue and they name it the hypopharynx or call it the laryngopharynx. So those are the three subsets, the three subgroups of the pharynx. Then we get lower and we go to the larynx. And so the larynx is going to be here, right in there. So the larynx is going to be the first region that air and food are separate, unless you don't count the nose because we don't want any food going in our nose. But besides the nose, the larynx is going to be below what's known as the epiglottis. The epiglottis is a flap that covers the larynx when we're swallowing food and directs that food posteriorly to the esophagus. We have a model here that we'll be using, and this is where the epiglottis, you can see it flapping down, but that's not how it really works. The epiglottis doesn't come down like a garbage can lid. What happens is your larynx comes up and the epiglottis teeter-totters down and over. 
And what happens is it's going to teeter-totter down and aim food backwards in the esophagus. So if you feel your throat while you're swallowing, you'll notice your throat rises, your, your larynx part rises, and the epiglottis, my hand is representing the larynx, and the epiglottis is open so air can go down. If you swallow, it comes up and the epiglottis is gonna point down, so any food that comes in is just gonna slide back like a slide into the esophagus behind. And the term glottis just means the space that air is going through. So epiglottis means above the space. It's sort of the covering of it. You can see here the three divisions or subdivisions of the, na of the pharynx, nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. The nasopharynx we know up high is where those eustachian tubes come and can calibrate air. Again, if you have a cold and excessive amounts of mucus, you're obstructing that eustachian tube. And therefore, if you're flying an airplane or changing something that's changing altitude, your tympanic membrane is going to move based on the pressure outside. And if you can't equivalent that through your pharynx, then you can, you'll hurt your ears because the tympanic membrane will continue to move. So that eustachian tube helps to balance the air pressure on the inside portion of your tympanic membrane. Then we have the oropharynx. We've got tonsils again all through each of these. The ring of tonsils helps inspect for incoming antigens coming through a respiratory tract. We end up there at the larynx. So now it's the first place that air and food are separate. Food goes down the esophagus path, air's coming forward and coming into the larynx and then the trachea. So we have the top thing is the elastic structure, which is gonna be the epiglottis. Then the other structures that we see within the larynx here are going to be your thyroid cartilage, which is the main thing that's your Adam's apple. That's the main part of the larynx that you see. This here, it looks like the, a plow or the front of a ship. Here's another model that we have. It's a quite nice model. We have actually see the thyroid gland on the side. We don't see it on this side, but you can see the location of the thyroid gland where we have the thyroid cartilage, this large structure, but the thyroid gland, you can see, sits well below it. And the isthmus of the thyroid gland is below the second cartilage structure, which is known as the cricoid cartilage. So it's really narrow across here, and then it flares out on the side like a wrapped around bow tie. And so the here is we have thyroid cartilage is your larger cartilage. It's your Adam's apple. Cricoid cartilage is another, your second large piece, but it goes all the way around. Notice the thyroid just flares out like a bow of a ship or a plow, but it doesn't, isn't continuous around the back. The cricoid is real narrow in the front and it is really wide in the back. Cricoid cartilage, on top of it are these two things that are called the arretinoid cartilage. You can see that in this diagram here. So if this is our cricoid and then this, I am gonna draw these like this because I think they're shaped like the letter A. So that would be the arretinoid cartilage sitting on top of the cricoid cartilage. So on the top of the arretinoid cartilage and their corniculate cartilage. Um, and then the cuneiform, you don't see in this picture, that's off to the side. But the cuneiforms are another landmark that you look for when you're looking down as an aerial view and you're gonna intubate someone and you're actually scoping them. So we can see the corniculates are right here because they're just on top. So now we're looking at from above. So you see the two corniculates and then the cuneiforms are lateral structures. So you'll just see them in this picture here. We can see them. You can see these double bumps. So you can see the model image like this, anterior view. This portion up here in the yellow is actually the hyoid bone. It's the only free floating bone in the body in that it's not attached to another bone. It is an anchor point for muscles, either of coming up into the mouth or muscles coming down below. So it helps balance that. It's, you're gonna palpate it, it's located at the base of the mandible. So we can see the anterior, posterior, and a lateral view. Again, with the thyroid cartilage is gonna be here. That's a big thyroid cartilage. And we have the cricoid cartilage here, large in the back. You can see how it's really wide in the front and really small in the back. And then we have the arretinoid cartilages right here. That's another arretinoid. 
the retinoid. So retinoids here, there's your retinoid, and then you can see on top of it are the corniculates. The vocal cords, also known as vocal folds, are larger in that they're longer and thicker in males. So pubescent males have a testosterone surge. The testosterone surge causes elongation of the vocal folds. So pubescent males tend to get a more prominent thyroid cartilage, therefore more prominent Adam's apple. Because we have so many muscles, and think of how long it takes for our kids to learn how to talk. You're patterning muscles to your brain to actually say certain words and pitches. That's why it's so fun to listen to babies when they start doing their noises. And they're like, going, ah, and they're making like their little happy noises. And it's like they're going up and down. And it, that is patterning in their brain of making this. They're getting this auditory feedback of, oh, if I'm doing that, it makes this noise and makes that noise. And they're goo-goo and gaga. And it's really them getting this auditory feedback of how to control muscles and make these sounds as air is being pushed out through here. And so we have so many muscles back here that's pulling on the retinoid cartilage and the corniculates. It's higher up, so it's got more leverage, so it's kind of pulling it in a different way, and it's going to rotate. They rotate in to squeeze them tighter. So if you, just like if you had a balloon that you blow up, but don't tie the knot in, and then you let the air comes out and you're messing with it, this is exactly what our focal cords are doing. So the more you pull back and tighten, think about these retinoid cartilages pulling back. It's like you're pulling back the reins if you're driving a team of horses on a wagon. You pull the reins back and you're just making it tighter. And then those vocal cords are gonna come closer together and then your pitch is gonna go up. So because male vocal cords are thicker and longer, the reverberations are gonna be lower. And so they have a lower, than to have deeper voices because of that. But because of the patterning that goes on, boys go through an awkward transition phase because their voices will change pitch. And it's because they're trying to say something, but all of a sudden their anatomy of their vocal cords are different. And so what used to work to say something all of a sudden comes out as a weird pitch. And they really have to go through a period of time to relearn and repattern their brain in order to accommodate they're rapidly changing. It's because it changes so much over such a short period of time to reaccommodate so they can. So that's what goes on there. But they tend to be longer and thicker in males. And that's also why males have a more prominent Adam's apple because to accommodate these larger vocal cords. Valsalva's maneuver is listed here because when you're doing the Valsalva's maneuver, that's why you're like grunt and you're holding your breath. Like if you're going to lift a really big weight and people tell you you shouldn't be doing this, you should be breathing through, they want you to conscientiously breathe through because if you're lifting a really heavy weight and you're closing your vocal cords, preventing that air from going out, you create such a high pressure in your thoracic cavity that your heart has to work harder. You have a harder time getting venous return. So, but that's what the Valsalva's maneuver is, is you're having great amount of pressure pushed in. So your thoracic cavity is being really like constricted down, but you're preventing the outflow of air by closing off your vocal cords. So this is a picture of an actual image, a photograph of what, if you're going to intubate somebody, what the vocal cords look like when they're open or where they're closed. So you can see how prominent they are. When they're open, you can see the trachea on the other side. So you can see these little rings here. We can see the vocal cords there. The, this is not right because you don't see the retinoid cartilage because you'd see only the corniculates on top of the retinoid cartilage. So that's mislabeled. And this one, I just kept this because I wanted you to see all the different muscles that are just in there. They're just hard to imagine, but we have so many tiny muscles within there. This is a really beautiful, fascinating job, actually, of um, the vocal cords. Okay, now below the larynx is our trachea. So here's our trachea, and you can see it has the hyaline cartilage, C-shaped cartilage. So in the back of the trachea, it doesn't come together, it's open, and it's just a membrane. And that's because behind the trachea is gonna be the esophagus. So if you have a huge bolus of food and you know, you're not listening to your mom, you know, eat small bites and you know, mom's right kind of story, and you have big bolus of food coming through, the trachea allows for that expansion of, so the esophagus can enlarge without causing an obstruction of the airway and allowing for the food to have a little get up for the food to make it through. So in this picture, we can actually see the esophagus right here. That's the esophagus, it's a little E there. 
and then this is the airway. This here is the hyaline cartilage. You can see that. Then lining the hyaline cartilage is the pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelial tissue with goblet cells. Um, and then on this image, we can see the trachea coming down. We already did the larynx up there. Starts with the hyoid with the larynx, thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage, trachea. We go to the right primary bronchus and the left primary bronchus. This is a cross section again, you can see of the hyaline cartilage and then the red is the epithelial tissue inside. I happen to like this particular picture because you can see the trachea and the bronchi relative to the aorta and the pulmonary arteries, just areas that we've already seen before, but you can see them in relationship. So you can see how the aorta, instead of going to the side, actually goes posterior and kind of crosses over that left primary bronchus. So the right primary bronchus is straighter and wider compared to the left, because the left kind of curves up a little bit more to accommodate the heart that sits below it. So the right is going to be straighter and wider. And this next picture, you can see if you're looking down, the person's facing his belly towards the floor, you can see how if you're looking down, you're looking straight into the right side. Left is curved to accommodate the heart. Then the bronchioles are named as they go out. So you have the primary right and left, and then it goes to secondary, and then it goes to tertiary, and it's named after that. So each generation, it's about their branching off. What I wanna show you is these little guys that I made. This here is a lung, no different than these dried lungs that I have here, injected with silicone. So it's not tissue, it's just silicone. That If you guys see white stuff on the table, that's what it's from, because these things shed. So I shake it, you can see this little white stuff coming off. But what I did is I took one of these lungs and I injected it with silicone. It's the same kind of stuff as you'd like do caulking around your bathtub or your windowsill. So it's really inert. And then I just took away and dissolved away the actual tissue. So what this is, is a cast of the airway. So if we're imagining back to the grapes, it's all of the little tubes that the stems would be if they were tiny little straws. And we casted that. So what I'm gonna pass around are these silicone lungs and you can appreciate how much tissue, you can just see it here. That's even before we even get to the alveoli where we've been exchanged gases. So I'll just let you check this out. The other thing I want you to notice, we're gonna talk about in a little while, the pleura. Remember we talked about the pericardium, the visceral pericardium that's touching the heart and the parietal, which is the sac. The lungs have the same kind of serous membrane. We have a visceral pleura that's touching the surface of the lungs and then a parietal pleura that's on the inside of our chest wall. So that relationship is all about how we can breathe. But the reason why I'm bringing that up now is this lung here, I have the visceral pleura peeled back. I took a scalpel and just cut it. So you can touch the surface of the lung and notice that it's visceral pleura. It's gonna feel different than if you touched it right here, which is gonna be like sliced millions of alveoli. So you can kind of see that there's a membrane over it. And then in here, obviously there's alveoli. Okay, so back to here. Primary bronchus and bronchioles. So we talked about the right being straighter and wider, the left curved to accommodate the heart. The bronchioles will branch, they're named based on their generation of division, primary, secondary, tertiary, and so on from that. And they expand to an immense amount of surface area until they finally end up at the last ones, the terminal bronchioles being the end bronchioles. And then the last ones leading to the alveoli. We can see here, this is the posterior side. So you can see the C-shaped cartilage doesn't fit all the way around. We have the right and the left. The histology of the bronchioles are such that we're gonna have the hyaline cartilage, which is gonna be this portion, and the pseudostratified we can see in there. You have big bronchioles and you have smaller bronchioles. That's a smaller one. The smaller ones may not have the cartilage. It is the level of these smaller bronchioles that actually asthma attacks will take place. Because they don't have the hyaline cartilage to keep it open, the contraction of the smooth muscle at the level of smaller bronchioles allow for it to change the diameter. The finally down to the functional units of the lungs, where gas exchange is actually taking place, is gonna be the alveoli. We're down here, it's a site of gas transfer, Diffusion distance is minimal because we have just a thin, thin-walled air pocket 
one cell layer thick, and then the other side, a capillary, also one cell layer thick, it's only endothelium. So oxygen's only going through two cell layers. It's a huge surface area. Remember when I kind of gave the example of a large chest cavity? We don't want it just to be a giant open bubble of air with just blood around the outside. The more tiny little rooms of air we can make, the more area like on the walls that blood can be at, you can have greater transfer of oxygen. So if you break apart these alveoli inside the lungs, which is the case for emphysema, you have less surface area for gas exchange to actually take place. In our alveoli, we have the type one cells, which I don't really refer to them as that. They're just those simple squamous epithelial cells where the diffusion's taking place. There are macrophages that kind of roam around, pick up any antigens that might've made it in there. But the unique cells here are the type two, which are known as surfactant cells. The surfactant is a detergent that's produced in the alveoli to prevent our alveoli from collapsing. So if I have this plastic bag, Ziploc bag here, it's all propped open and you know the wall, so it's an air sack. And the walls, you know, they can smush together. They separate pretty easily. If I had water in here, you can imagine how much the walls would prefer to stick together. The, the water molecules are attracted to each other, so it creates what's known as surface tension. Many of you might have noticed if you're camping in a tent with nylon walls, and when you wake up in the morning, if there's dew on the inside, you could unzip and open your door and just slap it against the wall, and it would stick. The ability for that door of your tent to stick to your nylon wall with the water is surface tension. So you don't want your alveoli to be really small here and have the walls want to go stick together. You don't want that attraction to be there. So surfactant is a detergent, much like just plain soap. that actually breaks up the water molecules so the walls are less attracted to each other and there's less inclined to collapse. This is particularly important in newborns because fetuses don't have air going into their lungs they don't really need their alveoli to be popped open so surfactant is something that's produced by the fetus in the last few weeks before they're born so babies that are born early often don't have not produced surfactant or don't produce enough or don't produce any surfactant and so they're lungs will have a harder time expanding and staying expanded if they don't have surfactant. So newborn babies, early term newborn babies are usually given an aerosolized version of the surfactant so it makes it down in there to break up that surface tension. This image where we see a bronchial, you see smooth muscle wrapped around it. We see a pulmonary artery. Remember, pulmonary arteries are deoxygenated blood because it's leaving the heart, so it's an artery, but it has yet to get reoxygenated, so that's why they're still deoxygenated. So these pulmonary arteries go out and they show them around the alveoli like weird little yarn balls. So schematically, I can see why they do it, but functionally, that's inaccurate. What happens is, yeah, you get a little capillary bed like this going across, and so it's nice to show your deoxygenated blood turning purple and then red, now fully oxygenated, now it's a pulmonary vein coming back to go to the body. But what really, truly happens when you have an alveolus, it comes to the alveolus as a pulmonary artery or a tiny little arterial, and instead of it being like a little string across the surface of the alveolus, it literally the way the capillary is around the surface of the alveolus, it literally wicks across the whole thing, almost as if it was like laminated rather than a little individual thread of um, capillary. So you have it spread across more around the round thing rather than just on along a line. So I wanted you to have that impression. So we have really maximized the surface area there. You can see the honeycomb pattern here, and we can see some of the terminal bronchioles into these regions. So surfactant is made by those type two alveolar cells. It's a detergent that's gonna break up the surface tension, 
and you see it in respiratory distress of the newborn as the condition if they don't have enough surfactant and their alveoli are not opening up like they should. We're gonna go through lung anatomy and breathing. So I'm gonna keep these guys here. Um, so our lung anatomy is we have on, and they sit like this. So I was, you hold it up like this because it looks better, but they sit in the body like this because they're curved around by the rib cage. So they kind of lie in the body. You have the left side has only an oblique fissure, means it goes at an angle because you have a superior and inferior lobe. The right side has three lobes and therefore it has a horizontal and an oblique fissure. So you should be able to name the lobes of lungs and name the fissures on each of the lungs. The interior portion where we have the bronchioles enter you can see this is called the hilus. You can see where the um, pulmonary artery, pulmonary veins, and the bronchioles are all kind of clustered together just to maximize the area of the lungs, the gas exchange. We sort of channel our arteries and our veins and our airways all together as it goes through the lung tissue. And so the entering and exit is called the hilus. This is a really cool picture, a cross section of a human. We can see what I like about this picture is the lungs go all the way up, like every little nook and cranny around. We can see the lung tissue clear up even in there. And so the lung tissue interfaces with as much area of the inside wall of the thoracic cavity as possible. And so this is going to have play in, play a role with lung mechanics and breathing. So the pleural cavity, I want you to imagine the surface of the lungs, as we mentioned before, is the visceral pleura. And then we talked about the parietal pleura. So if we have visceral pleura that's going to be on the surface, touching the lung itself. And then we have the around the outside. So the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura are separated. They're not as separated as much here. This is a huge exaggeration. So I want to use an example of these microscope slides, these glass pieces. When you put the glass pieces together, like if I were to, you know, there, say one's going to represent the visceral pleura, and the other is going to represent the parietal pleura. So you have the two. And so when they go together, visceral pleura, parietal pleura, there's, they would adhere, except it doesn't adhere unless we have water in them. So if you make it wet and then get some silicone off, stick it together. You can see I can turn it sideways even so there's, and let it go. It holds the glass to it. But the fluid that's here in this blue space allows for it to not only move and glide easily across each other, but it actually holds the visceral pleura to the parietal pleura. It actually adheres the surface of the lungs to the wall. To here, you can see how much of the surface of the lung is touching the chest wall. And so if we want to breathe in and we want air to come into our lungs, we have to expand our chest wall. It also attaches down to the diaphragm on the bottom. So we drop the diaphragm and expand the wall. We just enlarge our thoracic cavity, but it's literally pulling the lungs open at the same time. And so instead of having like a muscle where you have ligaments everywhere to pull it open, we're attaching to the entire surface so when the chest wall moves out, so does the lung. So we have a pleural fluid, which is in the space, but they're really, it's like this. There really is no space, you know, as we see here. It's an idea of a space, but they do run across each other very easily. It's a lubricated fluid, but the wetness and the water component helps adhere the lungs to the surface of the wall. If you were to have some sort of accident, maybe you got walked off your horse or get in a car accident and something penetrates your chest wall, penetrates into here, 
and actually penetrates the um, parietal pleura, then because the natural recoil of the lungs has, a, the lungs are pretty elastic, so they want to recoil down. But because they're stuck to the chest wall and you puncture the pleura, the recoil of the, the recoil creates a negative pressure. So when this parietal pleura is punctured, air goes in quite easily. And so when air goes in, it separates the visceral and parietal pleura, and then the lung is gonna collapse down into its normal, smaller collapse state. And you have what's known as a pneumothorax, which means air in the thorax. And in order to fix it, you have to seal up the wound, and then you take a syringe and you suck out the air, and then the lung's actually gonna reinflate and stick back to the wall and then you let it heal up and then that will be returned to normal function. But the beauty of how we open, how we can breathe is really the adherence of the parietal and visceral pleura together, hanging onto the lungs, the chest wall. So this is where we have the elastic recoil of the lungs here creates this negative pressure. So I, love, I like this diagram because it shows clearly the two layers. However, there isn't a gap. There's no real space in that, even though they call it the pleural cavity. How we breathe is, as I mentioned, we're going to drop the bottom out of our thoracic cavity. That would be the diaphragm going down. The diaphragm in its normal relaxed state is a dome that goes up. And I like to think of the diaphragm like a plunger on a large syringe. So if you have a huge syringe and you're pulling the plunger back, you're drawing air or fluid inside that syringe. The same as the diaphragm, it sits up like a dome. And when you it has a ring of muscle around your torso inside, and you have a more connected tissue membrane towards the center. And so when the muscle, the diaphragm contracts, it pulls the diaphragm down and flat. So again, like a plunger coming down, air is gonna get sucked in. If you wanna take a bigger breath, not only do we drop the floor down with the diaphragm, but then we're gonna elicit our external intercostals. My next demo. So here is this bucket. So I want you to notice on the skeleton that the position of the ribs, so there's one messed up rib right here. But if we look at, say, this rib here, where it's attached in the back is right here. This is a level. So this same rib towards the front is down low. So we can see the attachment for the, this particular rib is a few inches higher on the posterior side than it is the anterior side. That is very similar to the position of a bucket handle. So you can see that parallel with the way our ribs are to this bucket. Intercostal muscles means muscles between the ribs. We have external intercostals, which are on the outside, and we have internal intercostals, which are on the inside. The external intercostals are all about lifting up. So when we want to take a deep breath, not only do we drop the diaphragm down, but we take our external intercostals, and if this bucket handle is one of our ribs, it's going to lift it up. And notice when you lift it up, see if this is the dimension of the thoracic cavity, if you lift it up, you just expanded the thoracic cavity anteriorly by a couple inches. So it is a way for our body to say, okay, diaphragm, we need to expand down, drop the floor down. Hey, external intercostals, let's lift the chest wall up and out so it expands outward that way. So that is due to a muscle action, opposite to what people assume. People think, oh, you took a deep breath and the air pushed your chest out. No, it doesn't happen that way. You it pulled your chest out by your external intercostals and that negative pressure inside sucked air in. So we can see this is the effect of the diaphragm dropping down, so that's the red, and then we can have the inner external intercostals expanding laterally. Expiration is where that diaphragm, it dropped down, and then it just recoils back up as it relaxes. So it is the relaxation that pushes air out. So it's not an active process at all. So in essence, your last breath is an exhale. 
If you really want to push breath out more forcefully, that's where we go here to our intercostals and the internal intercostals on the inside are going to pull your ribs down and in and that is actually going to make your chest wall collapse. So when you want to breathe out forcefully, not only naturally your diaphragm go up, but you want really to blow out, say you're going to blow out a bunch of birthday candles. And if you got like a load of them on your birthday cake and you're like, you will naturally bend forward because that pushes your diaphragm up more. So that helps push more air out. And then your internal intercostals are pulling in even more. And then you're blowing out to get all your candles out. The next two slides are the muscles of inspiration, air in, and the next one will be muscles of expiration. So inspiration, light breathing, just normal quiet breathing is just your diaphragm contracting. You need a little bit more air to take, come in, external intercostals. So you're going to do some lifting. If you really want to bring in even more air, then we're going to need to have our scalenes and our sternocleidomastoid. Remember from our mastoid process, our, goes to our sternum and it divides also to the clavicle. That's the sternocleidomastoid. It's going to lift up your clavicle region. You have your scalenes top going to the upper few ribs. Even the pectoralis minor is going to play a role. Anything that's going to lift up higher on your ribs. We have our external intercostals all through the rest of your ribs, and these ones lift up higher. So that's for your maximal inhalation to fill up and expand your chest wall as much as possible. Then, when you want to expire, breathe out. If you're just doing quiet expiration, you don't do anything. Just diaphragm relaxes, and air just goes out. We only name muscles for what they do or for what their action is when they are actively contracting. So quiet expiration requires no <coughs> muscles, doesn't require anything. We know it's a result of the relaxation of the diaphragm, but you really can't say the diaphragm is because that's not its active job. The diaphragm's action is inspiration. But we can also do more what's called active expiration, and that's where we get the abdominal contraction as well as internal intercostals. So muscles of expiration, you should know that it's when I do ask you on your test, tell me the muscles of expiration or which muscles are involved in like on my name the muscles. What is this job? Inspiration, expiration. And so if I say diaphragm, its job to stimulate the muscle is to inspire, bring in air. Um, muscles of expiration would be abdominal muscles and the internal intercostals. Spirometry is just volumes. So I'm going to explain to you how we did it in the old days, back when I was in school, because nowadays they do it in this little simple digitized form. But we're going to still stick with some of these big volumes, and I'm going to explain to you the equipment that we used to originally get these. In the lab, I used to work at, and then I was a student in as well, person will be breathing through an apparatus. Their nose is plugged, so their only air coming in and out is going to be through their nose. And it goes into a cylinder, like a bucket, a nice tall bucket filled with water. And the tube comes in from the bottom, and then there's a little pipe that comes up past, you know, if we have this little bucket coming up this high, the tube comes up here. Then you have another bucket that's a little bit smaller that's inverted that comes inside this one and fits inside here upside down. If it's upside down, it's going to have trapped air, right? So our pipe that the person's breathing through comes up and it's above the water line because we don't want them to inhale any water, right? So when this person breathes out, this interior cylinder is going to rise because it's getting filled with air. And then the person's going to breathe in and it's going to fall. So you have this person breathing in and this cylinder here is going up and down, up and down. So then someone decided to hook a pulley to it and then the, on the pulley hook up a pen and next to it is a cylinder with a paper. So this here is a pen drawing as this other cylinder is rotating around. I've been looking for one so we can have one here because they're kind of cool to see and it's sort of, you can see every time someone breathes in it goes up and down. So the graph that I'm about to show you, this is how it originally was made. Now they just do them digitally and it's sort of so less gratifying just to see this membrane moving inside. So I wanted to, the volumes I have listed here, tidal volume is just your regular breath in and breath out, like the tides. It's just small, 
It's like the size of a Coke, can of Coke. Inspiratory reserve volume. That is the amount of air that you breathe in extra beyond a normal breath. An expiratory reserve is the amount of air that you breathe out beyond a normal expiration. And we're gonna see these graphically in a moment. Residual volume is the extra volume after you've breathed out all the air. So, if we, so we'll start from the top. Tidal volume, breathing in and out. You take extra breath in, that's inspiratory reserve. Back to breathing normal in and out. In and out breathing and then blowing out all the extra air that you have. That is expiratory reserve. And after you've blown out all your air and then you're like, get them all out, then you have no more air to get out. Then you still have air in your lungs. And so at that point, that's called residual volume. You're not getting that air out unless you get run over by a steamroller. So that is just the air that takes up the space of just the dimensions of your body. So that's what residual volume is. Vital capacity, anything that has a capacity is a couple of volumes put together. Vital capacity is after a maximal inhalation, breathe in as much as you can, maximal inhalation, and then blow out. So vital capacity is from maximal inhalation all the way to maximal exhalation. That's sort of like the widest range that you can get. That's someone's vital capacity. Inspiratory capacity is how much can you breathe in? That's normal breath plus the extra breath, the tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume. Functional residual capacity is how much leftover air do you have? Not only is it the expiratory reserve volume, but your residual volume too, together. How much extra air do you have available to you? So here's what it looks like graphically. Tidal volume is your breathing in, breathing out. If you have, and it's 500 milliliters, so it's not very much, it's kind of light breathing in and out. If we go for inspiratory reserve volume, this is the extra amount of air beyond a normal breath. So it doesn't include the tidal volume amount. It's after you breathed in from a tidal volume all the way up to your extra that you can breathe in. So that's again for the reserve. It's 3000 milliliters. Here we have after a normal breath out, this line down to how much you can breathe out and you can't breathe out anything else. Expiratory reserve volume, about 1200 milliliters. And then we have below that residual volume, which is about 1200. And these are rounded numbers for an average size male. And I've kind of rounded them to make it easier. But you can look them up and you'll find probably different variations. But this is at least to give you a ballpark numeric value to the, the magnitude of these volumes. I like these with the band, the color banding, because it lets you know, it kind of lets you know the ranges of each of these. So we have tidal volume here, inspiratory reserve volume, and then if we go clear from inspiratory reserve volume, including inspiratory reserve and tidal volume and expiratory reserve, that's maximal inhalation, breathe out to maximal exhalation. That's gonna be our vital capacity. And then you have these other inspiratory capacity are these two, tidal volume and inspiratory reserve volume. Either I will ask you the volumes or I will describe these volumes like maximal, in what's the volume? After maximal inhalation, your maximal exhalation. That'd be vital capacity. Or what's a normal, regular breath in and out? That would be, you know, tidal volume. So you should know them descriptively. You should also know them numerically. On your lab practical, you'll probably either have to draw the graph and label it, or I'll have a graph already there. It might have, you'll have, you know, where I just draw it out for you and then have you label it and then tell me the numbers. So that would be the context that you would see this. So I just want you to be aware of the, the spirometry, the names of the volumes, the amounts, and the graph representation, and that's it.